Respect, but I've, I've, I'm like, I've, what, 40, almost 50 years in the States, and now because of Trump, I'm moving back to Vienna because, sorry, no can do. So if it's okay in English, I might s s uh, switch around left and right, whatever, so make it easy. First of all, what an, what an honor that I certainly, in my opinion, don't deserve to be to be talking here, and because yesterday, at this time, Guthrie Garvin was standing here, so kind of intimidating, of course. But uh, I think what I'm doing today is uh, talk about my, uh, my, my career, whatever, as a, as a roadie, which I like that term better than tech, you know. But uh, 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 I hope uh, this all makes sense to you. And uh, my encountering, uh, I was invited by uh, two fellows from Switzerland, the Relish brothers, that created uh, uh, Jane and Mary, Mary Jane, uh, a guitar, uh, a really hypermodern guitar, which actually they should have brought one to their product line. When they met me, uh, I, uh, I'm a techno uh, geek, you know, I love the technology, whatever's available. And uh, in the beginning, I want to say, uh, the whole thing, all this whole show, doesn't matter if it's not between the finger and the string, right? So, Guthrie said that too yesterday, but this is, you know, if a person can play, then you can play. And uh, with passion or not, it's, this is where it's all happening. But since this is 2018, the day after tomorrow, everything is turning into a computer. And I was here before the computer, and it was wonderful, I have to say. But uh, uh, since the technology is here, you know, why not uh, engage it and use uh, what's, what's possible today? So uh, <clears throat> I uh, was born in 1946 in Weimar, by the way, and uh, uh, ended up then in Vienna. My father was uh, involved in the techni technical part of the theater. He actually, he... Uh, after the war, he redesigned the Vienna Burg Theater stage, Drehzylinder uh, Bühne, 660 meter diameter, with four platforms interchanging. So I was exposed to uh, every play, every uh, Shakespeare, every. My favorite play to date is Goethe's Faust. There's nothing that rivals that, as it really tells. Uh, the quest of uh, everybody, you know, what, what this is all about, so to speak. Anyway, uh, musically, um, when I was little, I remember my first encounter was, uh, I think, Elvis Presley from my, my dad's, uh, my aunt. She was married to a, a famous surgeon out in, uh, in around Salzburg, Riedem Inkreis kind of a playboy guy, but he was a top shelf, had a super f fancy ordination. And, uh, and I, there, when I was when we were visiting, I saw Elvis Presley, Harry Belafonte, and so I'd listen to that stuff, and you know, Tutti Frutti, oh, that was it. And hooked, and of course, then the Beatles came, and they changed the world, uh, covered the world with music like no one before or since. And uh, so I wanted to be in a band and, uh, in Vienna, so I started playing, put a little band together with friends. And uh, then there was the word in Vienna, well, uh, the guitar players, who, is, who are the, the, the guys. It was a band called The Slaves, and uh, uh, Charlie Ratzer, he was a gypsy, he couldn't read or write, but played accordingly in his style of music, naturally. So I went and saw them, that's when I said, well, I don't need to play guitar, all good. But ended up, uh, not that I knew what I was doing as his manager, uh, and in 70, Two, we went to America. My dad got me a, a ticket in 71 to visit the States. And why am I in America? Because in the 50s, when I was little, early 60s, America was like, you know, Grace Kelly, Marilyn Monroe, Louis Armstrong, uh, Tony Curtis, and made in USA, that was, that was the ticket. The Cadillacs, the windows went up and down by themselves, you know, all in today's, of course, a time different. But so in 71, I went to Manhattan with a friend of mine from Vienna who's, 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 who's American and we stayed at his brothers. And after Vienna, my whole life, which I thought was a huge metropole, of course, when you grow up and saw Manhattan and I said, well, this is it, that's, that's where I wanna go. And so with Charlie, I went, uh, and that was an adventure in itself because uh, I didn't really know where to go. I was determined, but what do I do? So I asked a friend of mine in Vienna who I knew had friends in the States. So he said, well, I know uh, 
Alexander Henrich. He's a silk screen uh, company. He makes uh, Andy Warhol silk screens and stuff. So I, I would never, could never do that today. But back then, I called the guy in the States and said, I'm so and so, and I'm managing Charlie Ratzer. Do you think we can uh, stay at your place uh, uh, for a little bit? I mean, you know, how, how can you do that? But he, reluctantly, I guess, agreed. And so I ended up in New York, not only with Charlie, but with his girlfriend and with his uh, well-endowed stepsister. Because <laughs> why I say this, because she got us in. When the Heinrichi opened the door, uh, he, well, there's four people there. I thought it was two. But since the Traude was her name, passed away already, she was attractive, so we got in. and. Uh, so the adventure started there. We, we stayed there for actually quite a while, but with, with Charlie as, as a manager, I had the responsibility to, to get something, make something happen. So we went to Greenwich Village, to all the clubs, you know, uh, seeing what's going on. And we were at a club called Gaslight, which also does no longer exist. Bob Dylan started there too. And so a band called High Voltage from California nine-piece band, I think all black guys uh, and a lady singer and one, one white saxophone player. And uh, so we said, well, uh, Charlie was a very imposing person by looks and just presence. So we said, well, can we uh, jam? And came to and said, yeah, bring the guitar. So next day we came with a guitar and uh, Charlie played and uh, well, he was hired. So we started uh, our career over there in New York. And of course, very adventurous in as uh, the band stayed at the back, no longer existence, the Chelsea Hotel in Manhattan, which is, was the artist, uh, really shrine uh, to date, and they, 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 they killed it now already a few years ago, I think. So we stayed there, and I, I, I was clueless, right? I, I mean, I didn't know I'm a fan of music and all that, and then passionate. But they had a tour manager, and he, uh, <clears throat> I remember since apparently the money ran out and we had something going on in Atlanta, Georgia. So we were told, well, we're going to leave with the rental cars that weren't paid for, of course, and, uh, and there was no internet. And uh, the tour manager said to everybody, okay, take your luggage, walk out, don't turn around, <laughs> to just, just sort of sneak out there, you know, which we then did. And, uh, uh, we uh, ended up over there, Atlanta, Georgia. There was uh, some, some gigs we had, we met various people. But in the band, there was uh, one saxophone player, guitar and saxophone and keyboards. That was, uh, Billy McPherson was his name, he's also passed away. Unbelievable musician, I mean, mind blowing. So my guy, Charlie, and him, they became good friends, of course, you know, and we, so we decided we're gonna leave the band and uh, see what else we can do, because they had another roadie, uh, Bob Holcomb was his name, and he's, he was from Indianapolis, Indiana, said, well, we'll, we'll go to Indianapolis and uh, we'll, we'll start something there, right? So we did, and uh, we got a drummer, uh, uh, was a, like a white guy, long hair, and then we had a bass player, and I, I'm so, his name was John McIver. He was Jimi Hendrix on the bass guitar. He was 10 foot tall, fingers this long, confident. Like, so our band, we called it Time, like Prince's band later on. And uh, so we started there, was successful and everything. Then. Uh, we split up. I stayed with Ratza in Atlanta and the, and the keyboard sax player, and we got a record deal. Uh, I don't even remember the company, but all went well. And uh, then uh, we met a guy there that was from Vienna, Austria, called Austrian Motors, a Mercedes-Benz shop and repair. And uh, uh, he, he said, well, let's do a tour with Charlie in Vienna, since he was a local hero in Austria, especially coming back from America. So that was a big thing. So we went back and we did that tour uh, with, uh, with American musicians that were all flown over and so it was all great. After that, uh, Charlie was there, uh, not too much was happening, but before we even left to the States, we, we were the band in Austria that we called it Gypsy Love, it was uh, Charlie, the drummer uh, was a gypsy, and uh, uh, Peter was the keyboard player, and Peter Wolf, uh, uh, was like Mozart at four, prodigy. I mean, unbelievable keyboard player. And he really turned me on as far as jazz goes. He gave me 
from beginning Zavin rule or whatever, all the, the, the you call it, you know, more than that. So I decided, uh, we, we, we talked again and said, well, let's go back to the States and let's go to Los Angeles. That's where, where all the music uh, is basically based off and uh, let's try that. And we did throughout America, very adventurous. I also, after high school, um, I was in, a, in an elite type school where my parents put me uh, called Theresianisch Akademie, and uh, sort of uh, the wrong place was all aristocrats and diplomats. That was it, so I wasn't really, but nonetheless, um, so in, and they all, after high school, they went to a few of my friends and studied, went to study, uh, use uh, law, law, to be a law student. I wasn't really interested anyway, and one day I went to a coffee house close by where we are, Vienna, is, as you know, the, the, the palace of coffee houses, and I saw this old guy sitting there. He was 70 by that time, ele elegant, you know, double row suit, and, and he was doing sleight of hand card magic on the table. So I saw that and approached him, and then a, a year and a half till he died, I was there every day, I got obsessed with the sleight of hand artistry, and I got good at it, and uh, it helped me a lot, and my goal was to uh, uh, audition at the Magic Castle in LA, which uh, I ultimately did. But I, I jumped back again, forward now again to uh, when I came back with Peter Wolf. So we landed in LA, money was just about out, of course, and uh, we uh, uh, knew uh, Alfonso Johnson, who was Weather Report's bass player before Jaco Pastorius. And uh, so he invited us, and that same night he said, well, let's go to the, to the Roxy, uh, George Duke, Frank Zappa, musician also in, in his own right, uh, also passed away already, God. <laughs> Am I still here? <laughs> uh, and and uh, so we saw that club, and, and Buddy Miles, uh, Hendrix is also a drummer with Hendrix, he was there, and the girl, uh, Ratza's stepsister, she had a, a, a relationship with him, at that point, and from the very first band that I mentioned, High Voltage, from uh, that we met from California, that we met in New York, Tony Maiden, the guitar player, and Bobby Watson, the bass player, they were founding members of uh, Shaka Khan's Rufus band. So that's how we then got in, and I knew uh, that Trout was hanging out with Buddy Miles. He was at that at that uh, club, so I walked up and introduced myself. I said, "Yeah, Trout, Trout." So okay, we all hooked up, and then we rented an apartment to, uh, with Trout together to share the cost and stuff, right on Santa Monica and Crescent Heights, middle of Hollywood. And uh, you know, went there every day. We went to clubs. The Starwood doesn't even exist anymore, but uh, the Whiskey, of course, and the Roxy. And Buddy Miles, you know, I can't even think about it, coming up at like five in the morning with platforms this high up the stairs to our place, to the girl, right? With, God, with angel dust and stuff like that. Oh my, that's, my head explodes right now. Anyway, so this is how all of that transpired. And uh, we, we made contacts and Peter, uh, we went just about every day to the guitar center. There was only, guitar center is a big music chain store in America bankrupt, I think, right now, but they're still maneuvering in Sam Ash and all that, along those lines. There was only one guitar center in existence, so we went there every day. Peter, was he came from a very rich family, so he always wanted the latest gear, you know, whatever, latest mini Moog, ARP 2600, whatever, to try out, and we had a phone in the apartment, so we exchanged phone numbers, right? So then time went on, and I... Uh, um, uh, I wanted to audition at the Magic Castle. I became a member, you know, for like whatever, $100 a year they charged. Now it's like $4,000 a year. And I wanted to audition, so I arranged myself for that uh, audition and uh, did my job there at the Magic Castle. Uh, and uh, five people sitting on the close-up table. And uh, I guess I did well. And my teacher, my old guy in Vienna, who uh, already had passed away, he gave me a book by Di Vernon. He was the dean of card magic. And he was at the Magic Castle, the senior, a senior person there. And he watched from behind what I was doing. And he said, uh, he called me, said, well, I like your work. Well, if you need to work, well, let me know. And then the next day, uh, the phone rang. Hi, this is Frank Zappa. Can I talk to Peter Wolf? As concise as Frank always was. And uh, so we drove right after the phone call. Everything always Frank Zappa right away. Drove up to Woodrow Wilson, uh, uh, to Zappa land, as I amicably call it. And Peter played two days, got the audition, got the, got the gig. And uh, so I was six years with Frank Zappa, and there was nothing 
in my life, I guess I could say the Beatles, obviously, they started my, my whole journey, really. And then Frank Zappa, that was the six years best time of my life. You know, I, I could have checked out right after that, actually. But uh, he worked, work, 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 and I could go on till he was 52 and died at 52 of cancer, uh, uh, prostate cancer, with 80 released albums with unmatched content, I might add. If you, I don't know how many people know Frank Zappa or, or, or our fans, but uh, he's every spectrum of all music and sharp. He, if, if you go online, I recommend to do so and watch YouTube clips of Frank. He was, he was right then about now and about probably what's going to happen God forbid, you know, with, with Trump and whatever. It's just the, the most brilliant person I met in my life and simplest man ever, ever. Just work, work, work. So what a privilege it was. We went on the on tour. Uh, well, a, a little tour episode. It was actually more than that. We started the tour in, uh, uh, well, I know the second show was in uh, Las Vegas, my first time in Las Vegas at the original Aladdin Hotel. That was, was no longer in existence. And uh, the next morning, and for me, the first gig already with uh, Frank owned his own sound and light system. And the first uh, gig, I thought, a semi truck, you know, a big American truck. I thought, oh my God, I was scared. You know, how, uh, when is this going to be empty, let alone being refilled again, right? So, but we did the gig and uh, I learned, you know, the tour bus and the whole, the whole nine yards. So the day in Tucson, Arizona, the day after, uh, uh, Phoenix, I mean, after Las Vegas, the production manager comes out and says to everybody, called everybody and says, well, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but uh, our tour manager is no longer with us. He killed him. It's not funny, but I mean, it's just, he killed himself last night. So just like for me, the little guy from Vienna, wait a minute, <laughs> what, what, have, what have I got myself into here? So the guy uh, took the purse, it was like $20,000 or whatever it was, and lost it in the casino, of course. So the bass player found him in the, bath, in the bathtub. So, but the show went on, of course, and uh, so I stayed with Frank uh, six years, 77 through 83, and uh, was uh, was a, a, a Keith, uh, Peter Wolf's uh, roadie for, for with keyboards, Peter Wolf and Tommy Mars, another genius musician, of course, and uh, the best time of my life to learn the trade like that, as 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 it was then and even today, uh, everything in rock and roll business is departmentalized. So you're either the, the the sound guy or the monitor person, or you take care of guitars or keyboards, whatever. With Frank. Everybody got out of the bus in the morning. Everybody started getting the lights up, his own trusting, and then the sound. So you, you learned really, really well. Uh, and Frank even always said uh, there should be a, you know, a, a, a sort of a, a schooling uh, for roadies also. And after Frank had passed away, Gail, his wife, she picked that up and uh, created in Frank's vein the name Zit, which is, I don't know if you understand what that's like if you have a Pimple, whatever, Zappa Institute of Technology, right? And I, I did a few years, I was teaching there too, so they hired lighting designers, uh, road managers, whatever, to have a, a class and then teach teach what there is to, to be learned. And anyway, uh, when uh, my six years, uh, yeah, the first guitar player that Frank had hired, the Frank hired a new band was Terry Bozier was on drums, and uh, Patrick O'Hearn, those are the two from Zoo Dalours with Eddie Jobson. There was the band before that, the album before that. So he hired Adrian Ballou, which he saw in Nashville in the club, you know, and uh, of course, phenomenal. And uh, I jump ahead now to uh, a year and a half into it, uh, uh, David Bowie came to one of the shows in Germany and he snatched uh, Adrian right away and Frank got actually furious, but so you know, Adrian took that gig. And uh, so, uh, the next guitar player was uh, Warren Cucurullo from Brooklyn, from Canarsie, New York. A total fan, razor blade sharp person, really witty, uh, uh, and one of the guys that uh, a wrong note is not in the vocabulary, will never happen, just, you know, musician um, A to Z. And uh, Frank said, I'll try you out, so he had it, so Warren got the gig. and. Uh, 
Yeah, I've been with Warner about 40 years. I mean, I jump ahead again. After Frank, we had uh, Missing Persons, the band, with Terry Bozio, Dale Bozio, Patrick, and Chuck Wild on keyboards. And that was, I would have to say, the best new age. But back then, that was the, you know, Pet Shop Boys, all these bands when they came up, and all, amongst them Duran Duran, of course. So, <clears throat> Uh, I've been with Warren since then. We had missing persons, and after that, when that disintegrated because uh, Dale Bozio, well, it was a wild, wild life there. So she, like things, I can't even say here. Whatever. So that's how it all broke up, and uh, uh, Warren, we sent out resumes and uh, video clips and stuff, and Duran Duran responded. By the way, when we were still in missing persons for a little novelty. Uh, at the LA Forum, Duran Duran at their heyday, they played the Forum. And at that show, Prince and Michael Jackson both were to come see Duran Duran. So it was to give an idea of what, uh, what impact Duran had. And they had a, you know, a, 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 a how you call it, a packaged band. They had, they had a good product, it was produced the right way. They had their hits and, uh, you know, we were like, I think 12, 13 years with Duran Duran. I, I've seen a lot. So, they hired Warren. Warren got the gig uh, as sort of after Frank, that was as a sideman, you know, so he, he fit the spiky hair, had the Yoshi Yamamoto clothing, so he fit and he could play, of course. And I remember they flew us to Paris where they made a record, uh, Champs Elysees, uh, Georges Saint Hotel, 10 star hotel there. <laughs> the, the producer would call like two, two three times a week, say, uh, the boys, meaning the three Durans, it was Simon Le Bon, Nick Rhodes, and uh, John Taylor. It, it doesn't feel right today. When I say it doesn't feel right for like four or five thousand dollars a day for the studio, well, it doesn't feel right. We're not doing it and having to pay anyway. So Warren just played played his parts. But then two years into it, he he's a very very out front guy. He said, "Excuse me, fuck this," and took over more or less to where John Taylor left the band. Warren hired uh, Wes Wimble, another bass player, and uh, we had Steve Ferrone when we started with Duran, talking about ten thousand dollars a show to get paid. And Steve Ferrone's been with Tom Petty, with a you've got a super renowned drummer, and excellent. But uh, so Warren hired uh, uh, Joe Travis, who's been with uh, Dweezil Zappa from day one, no longer, I have to add, but he was Dweezil's drummer, fantastic musician. And Joe Travis today is in charge of the Zappa Family Trust. Uh, he's the Vaultmeister. Because Frank, uh, and I had to do it once in the early days, Frank recorded everything always. So he had, uh, well, right now, uh, the house is sold, but uh, the, the underneath the uh, a swimming pool uh, uh, type size room with all his work, right, all organized. And to this day, the Zappa Family Trust is releasing material from Frank. There's so much. I was, uh, did a, almost 200 shows as a video cameraman also during the show and Frank let me do whatever I wanted. I had my, uh, the camera was not a chip camera, it was just a tube camera with like burn-ins, you go to the latch, but I had it down, I knew the show and uh, had my cable for the video signal only, cable off to the recording truck, Frank had a recording truck and the audio was mixed onto those tracks, right, to live audio, so it was quality mix. There's videos out there, actually Frank released a video from hell where well, Frank also came to my house because I was always techno freak. I loved uh, loved the, the stuff, you know, technology. So he saw that I would just whatever back then clap and the lights would come on or this and this and this. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, losing my my mind here, my track. But uh, uh, with the, the Duran Duran, that uh, it. It went well, you know, we, 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 we did well, we had the big shows, but Warren took over, and uh, uh, the albums that were, were then made with Warren, uh, Electric Barbarella, uh, um, two or three albums, if I would play right now this record here, Everybody would say, whoa, who is, who is that? I mean, it was fantastic. Didn't do it. Uh, Peter Raj was a Who's manager way back. He invented, if any other musician, he invented per diem. That's part of when you go on the road, you get paid a salary and then uh, per diem money too. So uh, we did okay. We toured got around the world many a times, but uh, Warren took over and uh, uh, called the shots and, uh, and wrote Ordinary World, Come and Done. And you remember he called me, Tommy, I made my first million. So he, he did, did okay on that, and he still is doing well. But uh, Warren is a very uh, uh, extreme person on all levels. So 
he's like uh, omnisexual, whatever that means, anything, he's, you know, he's a friendly guy. So he, uh, 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 then after Duran, well, when we went to Brazil, where he was still, uh, you know, not so in charge, he met a girl, Claudia Bueno, and she took him to the cleaners like, like there was no tomorrow. He, he, he adopted her son. He bought two houses in Brazil and all that. And my relationship with him sort of fl flawed there a little bit because he, uh, you know, it's, we had sort of a deal. You know, he said, Tommy, 10%, 10%, all that wasn't happening. Anyway, so I, I uh, uh, you know, we sort of parted at that point. And, uh, uh, I, I've been in LA, I, I worked after that with, I guess, a lot of people. I worked one gig with Jimmy Page at, at Nebworth 94, and uh, which somebody called me that was in the Durant crew because they needed a guy. Did Tears for Fears, did uh, Social Distortion, did, uh, did a world tour with Steve Lukather when Jeff Locaro died that gig. Jeff uh, Lukather was, uh, I don't know, you, if you're a guitar player, you might know Bob Bradshaw, the switching systems. Those are the first ones that really came out where you had control over, over quite a bit, you know. Warren had two refrigerators uh, at some point, you know, big gear. And uh, Bob Bradshaw's wife got pregnant, so Lukather needed a, a guy. And I, my friend of mine called me on that, said, check with, uh, uh, with Toto, no, no, to, for the two. And I said, well, I'm, I'm not gonna go replace uh, uh, Bob Bradshaw. I don't know what microfarad is or whatever, you know, to, to uh, you know. And, but then I was, two weeks later, I said, no, come, come see Steve Lukather. And Lukather is, as I like to call him, the man with the golden heart, the nicest guy. He was still uh, drinking a little, a lot there, so I had to, Maybe I had to drag him there more than once after a show and stuff. But really, you know, come performance, flawless, always, always uh, performing. And uh, uh, the, that tour, the last show we did uh, was a benefit for Jeff at the Universal Amphitheater in LA. And at that show, asked me who was not on stage from uh, Steely Dan, uh, Eagles, all the people that Jeff had played for, you know, Jeff Vaccaro. Well, I have to jump back one more story. Uh, after two or three years with Frank, Terry Bozio decided to leave. And I thought, whoa, what's Frank gonna do without Terry Bozio? He's flamboyant, you know, he's a skinny little Terry Ted Bozio. Once he plays, he turns into like a he-man. He's totally, and then, you know, the singing and everything. So, well, Frank went to, he's got some drummers, you know, good drummers as the first one, Dave Logan, whatever, it, it worked, you know. By the way, if you play with Frank Zappa, you had to have ready, give and take 80, 90 songs. There was no set list, and Frank would call the song right there. And Frank's music was not la di la. It was like massive, uh, uh, you know, knowledge to, to be had. But what Frank had, he, he would pull out of a musician what the musician would have never known that he could do. Because the discipline and the learning, the best conservatory in the world was Frank, to me. And, you know, Frank did London Symphony, London Philharmonic, all these uh, pieces that, of, of, that he composed, so, uh, yeah. Uh, so I just want to say then, uh, then uh, auditions were for drummers. So, uh, yeah, this guy, okay. I remember, I had to pick up a guy from the airport to bring to the Joe's Garage, which was a French rehearsal hall. And uh, we get into the front room with the drummer, as I dropped him off, and that he could hear what was going on in the, in the rehearsal hall. And he listened and said, no, no, take me back. He didn't want to go in, you know, intimidated, I guess. But then one day, Vinnie Caliuda walked in and sat basically on the, like this low on the floor, his yellow Gretsch drum kit. I'd say four minutes he played, Frank wouldn't even sit, just walked up, shook his hand and he had the gig. And uh, he then was my roommate for two years, talking about non-stop, non-stop drumming. And his whole goal was Jeff Bocaro. He wanted to be like Jeff, you know, had the same shades, the hair, just all that, Jeff Bocaro, Jeff Bocaro. Because he, you know, Jeff was the session musician in, in the contemporary music back then. And Vinny certainly accomplished that, even uh, maybe more than Jeff. He, you know, Vinny plays with Jeff Beck. Next day he goes and goes on tour with Faith Hill Country, and the day after that he does all in one take Megadeth record. So, there's you know that's that's Vinny, and to this day you know he's uh, as he, I heard him say once, like you know he's talking about playing like totally thing, so uh, he says, well, the one's, the one's relative. It always comes back around at some point, you know? So to 
give you an idea of where, where, where Vinny's mind is at. And uh, so, uh, where was I? Um, uh, I've, I have been since, uh, I live in LA, like I said, in the same apartment for 41 years now. And, but I'm moving, like I said, I want to move back to Austria where I have an apartment from the, my grandmother, uh, rent, it's rental, uh, Mite. She could write it over to my dad and he in the s late 60s wrote it over to me. Uh, uh, Kriegszins, it's called. It's like 202 euros rent. The guy next door pays 1,800 euros for rent. So unbeatable. So I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good. And uh, so, um, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see, who, who, am I, who have I been working since? I'm trying to remember what I'm actually doing right now. Oh, yeah, 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 wait a minute, of course. When I was with, with uh, Frank after Warren Cucurulo, Steve Vai showed up, beautiful young Steve Vai, 18 years old, you know, good looking. I thought, well, this guy, there's a jacket. And he uh, gave Steve uh, transcriptions of Steve Vai's, uh, of Frank Zappa solos. So Frank hired him, and when I, when I was a video cameraman, Steve was a guitar player, and I didn't know my, I mean, I, you know, I enjoy music, but I didn't really know about guitar playing that deep. And I, and I realized, here's Frank, and here's Steve Vai ripping it up there, like, you know, as if there's no tomorrow. So time goes by, Steve uh, 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 replaced Ingrid Malmsteen in Alcatraz. That was his first, after Frank, his first, uh, you know, uh, big event, and then, of course, to replace Eddie Van Halen for David Lee Roth. Well, how, what more can you do? You know, fill the issues, and then White Snake. And since then, he's got his own career. And I worked with Mike Tanili a lot. Uh, also, by the way, another total genius of music. Not because he plays piano and guitar at the same time, but just as a person. And his music is, uh, yeah. So in my in my life. Mike Keneally, Guthrie Govan, of course, and then I have to mention the name Ben Lacey. If you have time, go online, L-A-C-Y, no E. This is a guy, big guy, that plays a guitar, an amp, never looks at the guitar, no guitar pick. And what you will hear, the first time I saw him at the Namshaw guy from Roland said, you got to hear and see this guy. It was a Michael McDonald's song, Minute by Minute by Minute, that song he played on the guitar, and you will hear every bass, the full bass, ripping bass, all the chord steps, a full percussion track, and then the melody with every inflection on top. So, Ben Lacey is gonna play for my friends uh, with Relish Guitars from Switzerland. This is at least what I'm trying to accomplish as, a, as a, for, for demonstration and stuff. So, just wanted to bring that up so I don't forget. Um, I uh, uh, met uh, at the NAMM show a couple of years ago. I met, uh, uh, actually, this is how that happened. I was in LA and uh, Richie Zambora from Bon Jovi, well, he was no longer with Bon Jovi, but he, uh, they needed a tech for him. Him and Orianti, the girl guitar player, the, his girlfriend, were recording a record. And so I uh, uh, was asked to, to sub for his tech, so I did, and I brought, uh, uh, well, I have to sort of step back one more time. I apologize. In 1999, when I started with Vi, I had a Strat I had a, a, a guitar, a Stratocaster with a hex pickup, a Roland guitar that I had modded. What I thought, well, the lights in the neck, LEDs from Martin Sims in the UK. He was a guy who did that. This is a while back, obviously, almost 20 years, 18 years ago. So I had that in the guitar. Then I always thought, put the wireless in the guitar. Why not open the back instead of a cable, the belt pack and all that, you know? And I did two Ingrid Malmsteen tours, so I know what it is to, he's all night long, and then he's throwing the guitar 30 feet and I had to catch it every night. So, and I did, and I did. It's well documented. Um, and uh, anyway, so I, t I, 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 uh, I brought, uh, well, come back to this guitar. So Steve, I brought it to rehearsal, and he liked the lights and the neck and the pickguard had a holographic film, a Spectroflex uh, film, that confetti film that would, uh, would when lights hit it, would explode uh, on the stage. So for Steve, a perfect tool for flamboyance. Not an Ibanez guitar, but he could, you know, one, one song he played with it. And at the end of the tour, he asked me if I want to partake in, in, in the design of a new Steve Vai model with all these things that that guitar had, right? 
So, well, how can I say no, right? And uh, so I got all crazy and figured out. Okay, back then, I remember when 30 years ago the VG8 came out from Roland and you hit the string and the saxophone would come out or a keyboard. Well, that uh, thought that must be, that, that must have that, right, in the guitars. So I said to Steve, well, don't you want to play uh, a synth or a, a, a oboe or a flute? And he said his answer is almost true till today. He said, yeah, but those things are never track right. It certainly improved in the meantime, you know, the technology has progressed very well. And so anyway, so I started on that, and as time went on, in 2012 at the NAMM show, uh, PV had a guitar there that they showed, uh, 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 auto-tune for guitar. It was a $600 entry-level guitar, and the guy shows the guitar, and uh, the fellow from Kemper, the both uh, Christopher Kemper was there too, and we watched that, and puts it out of tune, so totally, yikes, out of tune, pushes the button, and the guitar is totally in tune with the same sound, right? So I was fascinated, I got in touch with Antares, and. Uh, connected with Dr. Andy Hildebrand, genius, who created the uh, autotune for the vocalists, you know, of the world. And uh, so it got uh, intense and I uh, 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 hooked up and so he said, well, for Steve Vai, Steve Vai opened obviously many doors for me in my life, I, wouldn't, I couldn't uh, negate that. And so what guitar? So on my 66th birthday five years ago, I'm over at Vice House doing something in the studio, and he was all dressed up, and photo photographers were there, and uh, uh, so I was called in, and he calls me and says, "So Thomas and holds Evo, holds Evo, his original main career guitar, 26, 27 years, and uh, so, so this is not Evo, but actually better than Evo. Sorry, I have to say that it's true. So." In Japan, they made 100 copies of Steve Vai's guitar for $10,000 each for sale. They're all sold, obviously. But only the Japanese could do this, down to the last ding that's on that guitar. Everything, right, including the crack of the neck. I mean, I don't know how they, how they did really all that. It's, it's totally authentic. So, as I was there in the studio, uh, Steve, we talked about Evo, and I remember when I started with Vi, all five, six, all white guitars, all the same guitars, you know, flow. So I put uh, like loud tape here, orange, yellow, green, whatever, to, so I know I gave him the right guitar when the next song started. And uh, so, <clears throat> so we talked about it, and uh, so I said, well, what's that? I said, well, that was a piece of Velcro I thought I could use somewhere, so I didn't throw it away, so I left it there, whatever. So the Japanese copied everything. None of that yet. So. Uh, and, I, and this day for me was paramount because it was my 66th birthday, so I could, uh, from the IRS, from the tax department, I, I make a million a day, I still get my $1,100, right? That was before it wasn't like that. So I said, wow, what a great day. This is my, my 66th birthday. And Steve said, because he's born 6, 6, 1960, six months, six days. So he said, wow, your 66th birthday? Well, here, this is my gift to you, and, and, and handed me the uh, evil where it said, little funny story where it said, one of 100, right? So, wow, the Ibanez people were also, oh, well, well, you deserve it, okay, well, great. And I'm not really, a, I play for my own fun, but I'm not a guitar player. So, okay, then she says, well, you know, let me, let me, let me keep the one of 100, and, and, and you get two of 100. So, yeah, thank you, thank you, it's all good. So, a few weeks later, because they took the guitar back, I, uh, I, I go to Ibanez and they give me the case with the guitar. So I get home and uh, I uh, open up and I see one of 100. So I say, oh, mm, they must have, well, must have something wrong. So uh, in the sequence then, in Germany, in Spain, in Italy, people come to the show with this guitar that they bought for all that money and they all said one of 100. <laughs> yeah. So, but Steve, uh, not in bad intention, screwed up. He, when, they, when they brought it to his studio to sign all these 100 guitars, he wrote down one of 100, which is true, one of 100, one of 100. So all these guys, and I realized that's when this came out in the fore. So on mine, he wiped it off and wrote down two of 100. So I have at least something special, right? So as uh, Dr. Hildebrand came to visit me and saw my, my guitar system, I've been working on a guitar system 15 years. It's called Sonica. A masterboard, MIDI madness, pedal du jour, interchangeable, three connections, 90 pin, right angle Elko connector, 256, six power jumps, so all comes out of one wall outlet, and uh, XLRs to the speakers, and uh, off you go. And in my house here, I turn my rig on right here by pushing this button, turn uh, 
uh, the lights on, and then I dim the lights down, and then off you go. You know? Avatar, free fall, just played. So uh, I showed, I said to Hildebrand for Steve Vai, well, if you put it in the Evo guitar and if you model the DiMaggio pickups also, then he would get a guitar that he knows what it sounds like and uh, let's see what, what he, how he reacts, you know, with that technology. Well, so they made the guitar and they put the Antares system in here, Autotune for guitar, Antares, which is, uh, also, no longer existing because uh, a little closer here. Because he still got uh, makes money of it, of course. But he sold it uh, last Christmas. There's a new investor, a new CEO, and they dropped the AutoTune platform, unfortunately. And they, he even had a pedal, ATG1, it was called. If you don't want to put it in a guitar, but you have a hex pickup like a Roland guitar, then you have AutoTune on the floor. And the features, and I'll show it in a second here. So. That was put in, then I always uh, feel you have to have a sustainer in the guitar. Uh, Alan Hoover's uh, first Fernandez sustainer he created, and then the uh, Sustainiac, as he calls it now, right here, switches right here. And Michael Spalt, I have to mention, M Master Luthier from Vienna, Austria, he created the EGB, European Guitar Builders, those are all the guys in this room. Um, he. Uh, he did a lot of work on this as well. And then after a while, as Nikita, the guitar, all I do is turn it on and ready to play. So no cable, no belt pack, you know. And uh, then I have also in here, I believe, uh, like, you know, the tuning guitar is like this, then you do this, you contort your fingers sort of with a with peg. Ned Steinberger, 32 years ago, came up with the Steinberger tuners with the headless guitar, so people thought, nah, that's, that, I don't like that. Well, he came up with a guitar then with Ned, with his tuners, 40 to 1 ratio, right here. You don't have to look, you don't have to contort the fingers, and you can play a melody even. Well, let's, in fact, let's do something here sonically. Uh, what's, what's the timeline here? Well, if no one says anything, then... Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, I want to mention quickly also, when I started with Vi in 99, I'm, I love the wireless platform, I mean, wireless today, imagine, it's, it's, it has to be. So, um, the, a guy, Coker, a uh, frustrated guitar player from Sacramento, who didn't want the companding like that of an of a analog wireless, came up with the first digital wireless, X2 it was called. And uh, when I started with Steve, I already used them. He had a new one on his shelf, and I'm proud to say that. I said, well, we should try that out. And I remember he tried, and this was built in my Fender guitar that he played on that, on that tour with my, with my features. And he tried and said, wow, I like that better than the cable. And we used it till two years. It was 900 megahertz frequency. So the cell phones in Europe were on that band. So in Italy, the cell phones would come through his speakers, you know, so that was, and by is an instant gratification guy. If something doesn't work, if something didn't work, he said, take this, get a video camera, get in your van, drive over it, film it, so I know I'll never see it again. So that was his uh, mentality there. So Guy Coker sold the rights to Sennheiser from his back then 20-bit, today it's all 24-bit. Uh, they went to 16-bit, it was called Evolution, didn't really do well. And uh, then uh, Line 6 bought the rights from them, and Yamaha bought Line 6, so he's wireless director there. And uh, the new wireless is all, and this was my inspiration for something that I have now on my guitars. Uh, the new ones, G70, G75, and G10, and now new one coming up. GX100, totally new wireless platform with no dropout. They go to sleep after four minutes. So if you don't move it, just put it down, and then whenever you move it, and this one is actually on signal. So I'm gonna plug this in here right now. Let's see, I have no idea if this is all work. We have, didn't even try it before. So get the, um, where is our friend here? Yeah, give it a try, see, see if I'm all turned on. Yeah, oh, hold on, I gotta turn the guitar on. So this is the main feature that I, we, my partner, I have a 30 some year old, uh, 30 some seven years, I've been working with Ed Clothier, my partner. And this is called superpower, we call that. Should not be a G, but the international on-off symbol, the circle with the, with the bar. So you turn the guitar on, hold it down for two seconds, right? And now it's on, yeah, green and Red and it's on. Every time you move it, accelerometer based, it uh, it 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 uh, knows to stay on. This I only have for 30 seconds, so it might go to sleep just for test. So I don't. Everybody doesn't have to wait four minutes for me to demo that, right? So here it is. It's on. Okay. And uh, again, I'm not a guitar player, but I have a really good one. Eugen Leonhardt. Okay. 
So come on up here. A fantastic guy. So give me just a second. I give him the rough idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to what, what's going on here. So the, the, the core of Antares. So this is now, this is a regular electric guitar with these pickups. And uh, this is not the Marjo. This is the sustainer pickup, which acts when not turned on as a sustainer. So I think, right, Steve Weiss, uh, sustainer guitar flow, which is Evo and flow, those two, his two main characters. He's got the Fernandez. So he's got to always reach down here to turn it on and off. And so, you know, so I think, yep. You play guitar like that, so everything has to be in that path. Because every second counts when you're 71, trust me. So, so that's the guitar. I can tune here, and uh, so for me, I even got a second tuner right here, and on some Boris guitar that I built, right? Uh, uh, it's built into the next, I can't even see it from the front, but uh, so um, let me just tune that up quickly here, make sure I'm, I'm tuned. Well, you can watch this tuner while I do it here. And see, with these tuners, you don't have to contort or go, but you always got to come back from, from low. So I do it here. Yeah. Huh? Now? We got to finish? Well, let's let, then one more thing, please. So at least to get the, uh, the auto tune feature. Well, let me be radical here. Check this out. Okay, I'll do this, I detune it here. By the way, here's the tuners. You can do that with the tuner, right? <laughs> so I put it out of tune now, ouch, ouch. So now I turn Antares on, okay, I strum. Or I want, I want this, I go 12 seminoles up or whatever you want. I couldn't tune it like that. All this, by the way, uh, just so, so we're not all a waste of time here. Here we go, one more time here. So what I'm, what I'm doing here, I can do here as well. Here we go, okay, so here. Well, let's, let's do an uh, open E. Oh, hold on, am I connected? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not connected. One more connection here. This, which should be Bluetooth, I agree, but they never made it that far. But check this out. It's very convenient. So here we go. So <clears throat> open E, open sustainer, so you can hear. Or even here. Nashville guitar, acoustic, great acoustic guitar sound, by the way. By the way, back to normal, all you do is this, the, because the priest, uh, I wish I would have more time. Now I'm back in the normal guitar here. And let me. And yeah, nice acoustic guitar sound. Well, I guess we, since we have no time here, uh, it sucks. Acoustic. James Hetfield from Metallica. He has two uh, Variax guitars that uh, he sent to Antares, ripped out the Variax, put in Ant Antares just for the acoustic sound because that's what he wanted. So there's a anyway. It's endless. Where would I? Where do I end? And I can play, by the way, two wirelesses here. I could turn this wireless on now and play into another amp, and this one goes to this. So I mean. This can be unplugged and uh, off you go. Wanna play what, two or three bars? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Okay. I give you a regular guitar. Sound.
in conclusion here, uh, when I was with uh, uh, Zambora at Capitol, I showed these guitars to Richie. He wanted the uh, uh, same guitar. And the staff engineer, after seeing my guitars, came down and said, let me show you this. And he brought a guitar from Relish Brothers in Switzerland, Jane, the model, that just, whoa, what is this? Because, I mean, stuff like that. Where can you do this? Right? So this one is loaded like uh, uh, it has the uh, uh, ref pad from Israel in it, meaning you have a uh, two square inch surface right here, X axis, Y axis, and three Navi buttons, where you can do up to eight things with their, with their guitar station, a nice guitar processor at the same time. Wawa, whammy pedal, change patches, you can do it all from within here. And I'm sorry, I hope this was okay, and I, I got lost in time, so. But again, Relish Brothers, Switzerland. This is it, the Phantom Jane. All right? Thank you, Thomas. I mean, I'm so sorry. I wish, I wish you could have all heard this guitar, the same technology basically than in this one, but that, was, that, was, that led up to this guitar, so that's, and I guess, I ran out of time, as always.